Hi folks, welcome to my Bit Retro Journal. Today I'm going to be uh, showing something on my um, portable uh, Clive Sinclair computer from 1988 called the Z88. And I've shown it on my channel before, and um, but um, this time actually um, I thought I was going to do a very simple quick fix and it turned out to be a nightmare. So it seemed pretty lost when I, when I had broken it. Um, and uh, the fact that it works again. It makes me really happy. Now, the, what the problem was, and I showed this in my previous video, if I put the um, contrast all the way up, you'll see that there's a row of, or a column of pixels that's light, so it's it's not turning on. And so, having worked on um, LCD screens before, I thought this would just simply be, I want to put this back in, uh, I thought this would just simply be a fix uh, requiring me to take off uh, take it apart and usually there's a, a, a metal bezel that kind of holds down the LCD screen and it usually uses sort of a contact a press contact to the logic board and I figured and these are in the contact there are these rubbery uh, strips called electromeric strips and I assumed there was to be one on the top and one on the bottom and I simply would just um, take it apart uh, unpress them and uh, find the particle that was in there that was causing the a column of um, pixels not to turn on and uh, yeah clean it put it back together and uh, have a, a brand new um, um, laptop Clive's laptop from 19 I think it was created in 1987 even though it's called the Z88 and um, yeah so that was uh, that was the intent and then I was uh, perhaps going to show you uh, what I did and do a tour of this but that's not what happened. It actually was quite a disaster. I, I still actually have it apart, so let me quickly uh, show you what what we have here. So there's basically a f uh, five screws that hold this down. I don't know why there's five. There's one, two, three, four, and there's one here. So no idea. I think it's one, two, three, four, and there's one on the outside. Maybe because there's a, a serial port there. It needed extra support. So this comes off, and you can see here's the um, LCD screen with the bezel. Um, and what I got wrong here is that the bottom does not have an electromeric strip. It just has a rubbery strip. You have a 640, um, a strip, 640 contacts for the 640 uh, columns. And then you have a, 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 um, ribbon cable with 64 contacts. And that ribbon cable is ultra, ultra thin. In fact, it has the thickness of like a receipt. That's what this is. And what had happened is when I took it apart, of course, I had to then lift it up in this direction. And so right away, because it was short, it kind of formed a crease. And then upon opening and closing, that crease, uh, and I, had, I fudged with it a few times trying to get this pixel to come back, cleaning it, and it eventually uh, caused a, 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 a hard crease that caused the, uh, a bunch of the traces to break. And the reason it caused a crease, by the way, is because at the top, this was glued on, but there was also some protective tape on the bottom part, uh, something like the clear tape that was harder and more sturdy than the ribbon. And so it, it caused it to bend right there. And that's, yeah. And, and once, of course, that broke, I started losing um, uh, rows of pixels and I, I couldn't get them back. Um, I eventually decided to cut, it was about a centimeter off of a, I don't know, it was no longer than five centimeters. I had to cut about a centimeter of it off, and I realized that I had very little to, to, to work with. Plus, it was very hard, you know, to work with in terms of having, it was still being connected to the board, and how was I going to then you know, re-glue it on because they used glue. In fact, I had to scrape the old um, ribbon off, and that took a while. I had to be very careful not to damage the contacts that you basically, you don't really see them on the LCD glass, but they have very fine contacts as well. So it was just constant disaster waiting to happen, but um, I got it done. And I, I want to show you, I, I took some pictures along the way, but I didn't expect it to be successful, so I didn't film it. Plus, it, it would have been really more frustrating to have to film it, because then you have to worry about the camera, the lighting, etc. And I really just wanted to fix this. Um, before I show you the pictures, let me just take this a bit more apart. So this is the keyboard, and it just kind of folds down this way. It's got a really nice ribbon cable. Um, what you can't see here are just a bunch of 
resistors and a speaker and the and the crystal. But there's no ICs back in this area. So all we have is the Xilog Z80 processor. We have, I think this is ROM, and this has to be RAM, and then this is the, sort of the logic chip that glues everything together, and then more passives like resistors and whatnot, probably for the power on the screen. But um, that's it, and uh, it's a really uh, elegant design. It, it's got actually, um, you can see right here, I've got two cartridges in here, and the cartridges themselves are actually 128K RAM and then uh, 32K EPROM. And I do have an EPROM reader and writer, so I'm wondering if I can use that to transfer information. And this supposedly can also read and write EPROMs. So um, I'll have to investigate a little bit further. But um, yeah, so this was um, a, kind of a harrowing uh, um, fix that I had to do. Um, and when I got it to work, it was one of those ec ecstatic moments because I really thought I had ruined this. And it's really hard to find, I mean, you can't really find replacements. What you'd have to do is find maybe, hopefully, a broken Z88 that you could then take the screen out and, and supplant it. But, you know, one of the joys of retro um, computing is that I like to take care of retro gear and not destroy it since these aren't being made anymore. And so I was really upset that I had destroyed one and I would have to find another one and, and, and then trying to find a broken one. You know, people do hang on to these. Um, so luckily I hadn't found one yet and luckily I was able to fix this one. So a question I have for my viewers is um, the company that made this is called Optrex and they're from Japan and I'm curious whether or not anyone knows if this LCD panel which is just a standard LCD panel in some ways. I don't know if it was especially manufactured for Cambridge C88 or if Clive Sinclair just took an off-the-shelf part. But I'm curious whether or not this was used for some other machines and if I could find one, because I'd still like to replace this. It's it's almost 100%. Now, if you, if you, if you do this very slowly, I'm going to turn this back up. You'll see that there's a, it's, a, it's slightly, when you go to, not full, there's like a slight, it's a little lighter on the, the three rows of pixels. The only assumption I can have is that I didn't quite uh, clean the traces, three of the traces. I think it's trace three, four, and five under the first, from one to 64. But it, it only happens when on full, you can't see it, and when you actually do it to the point where you need it, you can't see it. So I think it's fine. Um, but um, what I want to show you um is i took pictures along the way and i just wanted to run you through those pictures to demonstrate to you what it is that i had to do in order to fix it and to give you a little bit more of an idea of of, of, of what it looked like as i had it apart so what i'm going to do is i'm going to transition to um the pictures that i've taken all right so let's 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 follow me there so what you see here is the lcd panel taken apart and it's this is after I cut it because it that ribbon cable you see to the left side that's kind of folded over should actually form an S and then re be reattached to the edge of that LCD panel. So the LCD panel should really never be <laughs> sitting like that. But I had already cut it and cleaned it so you can see um, that's clear glass. And, uh, um, you know, I scraped everything off to make that uh, viewable. Um, to, I'm sorry, not viewable, but to make, to, to allow me to attach that. And if I zoom in on the uh, uh, ribbon cable, you can see that it's just folded over and very paper thin. Had to do next is then figure out a way to um, support the uh, ribbon cable so I wouldn't add any more creases at the same time adding a, a, a surface that I could scrape. And, and what I learned to do is watch some videos and the best way to do this is I use the sharp knife and so this was my rig and you can see I have two tongue depressors that are just kind of sitting there giving it some um, um, height so that the cable could easily curve around and then I sort of taped it down with some painters tape that wouldn't adhere uh, permanently and this gave me a, a surface where I could slowly scrape away the plastic covering so that I could get back to the contacts. Now um, Originally, um, I wanted to get about three or four millimeters to get good contacts. But when I first tried it, I literally um, scraped some traces away uh, halfway in the middle. So I lost another 
about one and a half millimeters. So I ended up uh, taking a new strategy of, of trying to do smaller amounts because if I could get any contacts, it should work. Um, to help me with this, um, I used uh, a, some magnifying glasses that helped. And then, of course, um, I also used um, a Swiss Army knife that was really sharp. And that's kind of what I used to help me um, scrape the um, traces away. And I did it very slowly. Um, it took me maybe about an hour. And you know, it really only had one shot at this because if I took too much of the ribbon off, it, I just wouldn't have enough, and I couldn't find any replacement ribbons for that. Um, and so the, the next picture, you'll see that um, here uh, it shows you um, the end result, and I, it, it worked pretty well. Um, you can see that they all remained intact. I, I, I put it, using a magnifying glass, I put it in front of a, a white light, sort of a, not a very glaring one, but just something bright, and I was able to really view and see that all the traces were intact. There was like one or two that might have been slightly um, part of them taken off, but they were, still had a substantial amount. So I was pretty confident that I had, I was the best I was going to be able to do. The next step is I put a piece of tape on the back of it and cut it so that I could adhere it to the LCD panel. Let me show you that. Um, you can see here that um, this is, with the um, the piece sort of glued on top and aligned, and there's a tape uh, that you can barely see that's sort of holding it in place, but it's not enough to actually cause contact. But it, it just held it in place. Uh, the way they did it, uh, they actually must have had glue between the traces so that it really adhered down. So it was just a specially fabricated ribbon cable where it was glued on in all the places except where the, where the the metal traces had to contact the LCD screen. So it was impossible to recreate. But what I thought about doing is using a pressure fit and having the bezel kind of press down on that. And so I gave that a try with, um, you can see here, I had a um, sort of a rubbery um, patch and I kind of pressed down on that. And then I sort of moved my fingers across. And as I did, um, each of the um, rows would light up. And that gave me confidence, um, but then I had to figure out, you know, how am I going to uh, make sure that it presses down and stays pressed down. So I came up with um, a thin rubber um, strip, and of course I didn't have the right size. I had a, a piece of hard rubber that was just not thick enough, and if I doubled it up, it was too thick. It would actually bend the LCD, so I, I used one piece of rubber, cut it to size, made sure that it wasn't wider than the... LCD's length because I didn't want it to, when pressure was applied, pinch the edge, pinch the ribbon to, to the edge so that it would cause again breaks. So this is sort of inset uh, by a millimeter or so. So there's, um, so the ribbon cable kind of uh, extends and then finally curves down with an S. It's hard to explain, but um, hopefully you can see it in the picture. And then what I did is I, I, I glued another piece in a similar size, but I used a um, bicycle rubber inner tube, which is much softer rubber, which gave um, uh, elasticity that helped. Um, so that was the, the rig that I created. And then, um, of course, I put the bezel on it. And when I did, um, I got what you saw, what I have now. So let's go back to the computer. So again, when I, when I did that, I got, again, if I use full... Yeah, I got exactly that, which is what I wanted. And then again, when you adjust it, you get um, back the original screen. So I was able to save it and uh, very happy that I was able to do that because um, it was, um, um, yeah, it was a nightmare project to be able to uh, um, to have to save this, this computer that, you know, is part of my my um, nostalgia. This is, this is a computer I've owned since either late 89 or early 1990 i bought it um again at a discount i think they, they were discounted pretty quickly um but i used it actually with um my macintosh 2si and i there's i have software for it that allows me to use the pipe dream software which is the word processor can i get it on here um i think it's this one and that is the editor and it actually lets you save um the um, information and then 
able to load it, I think in Mac write. I think this is what the software uh, translates to. And, and also Pipedream also acts as a spreadsheet, which you can then also translate on the Macintosh. I'm actually going to do a, a set of videos for uh, Marchintosh. Uh, that, uh, and one of them will be to, um, uh, uh, demonstrate the power of the, um, this particular device, uh, in conjunction with the Macintosh. Now I'm going to hook it to my PowerBook, which kind of seems silly because a PowerBook is a portable, but just be aware that in the day I didn't have a portable. I had a desktop Mac 2SI and I was able to use this very light, um, uh, if you saw inside, I'll take this off again. Um, it uses um, four AA batteries, and uh, here I'm actually using rechargeable ones, but, um, you know, it, you can use alkaline and whatnot, and uh, it lasts for a very long time, and uh, has a pretty good screen, and, uh, you know, again, I wouldn't have mucked with the screen if it weren't for the missing um, bad pixels, but, um, so it, it was a really good machine to um, utilize for, uh, as a laptop for the Mac, and they actually, you know, they had specific software for that, which was the Mac transfer, the Mac link transfer software that did the transfer, but also the, the, the conversion so that it would work with a Mac write. And I don't remember what the, um, what the, um, the, uh, the spreadsheet program was. It wasn't Excel, but I should have all of that still. And so that, um, yeah, that was a, a really cool portable and, uh, uh, so actually used it to do some writing while I was um, in grad school. Um, and uh, it was nice not to, you know, to be able to sit outside and do some writing and then transfer it back to, to your Macintosh to to be able to print it, etc. So this was a very handy computer. It has all sorts of uh, programs. I think it even has a terminal program so you can log in. I think I might have logged into CompuServe back in the day. Um, so, um, yeah, a very powerful um um, pseudo laptop. I give Clive Sinclair credit. You know, he, um, I think this was his, his redemption machine. I think when he, um, sold Sinclair Research after the QL failure, uh, QL is right up here, which is probably not my screen. Um, um, you know, he came back two years later to develop, or almost a year later, I guess, because this was 1987, I think is when this came out, the Z88, and it has the same. I don't know if uh, Rick Dickinson must have had design decisions in this because it has that same feel. It's got a beautiful keyboard, much better than the QLs. Um, really nice feel and long battery life. And, it, you know, if you if you read um, the book Delete, uh, Design History of Vaporware, they talk about uh, Q, the next model QL was going to be a laptop. They wanted that to be the first model as well, but, you know, technology in, 80, in the early 80s wasn't quite there. And so he got what he wanted with this, and this was not as much heralded because he, he lost his company at that point. But yeah, a really cool machine um, that um, I got to use and actually really used with my Macintosh to to write papers, access CompuServe, um, do all sorts of cool things. And um, um, I will try to showcase that, but what I wanted to show you today was I was able to save this uh, from the trash bin or for parts because um, I had broken the screen. So um, I'm sorry that I didn't film it. In retrospect, I should have. Uh, it would have been, but it would have been a really frustrating, very highly edited, frustrating video. But at least I can sh share with you that I was able to fix and save and rescue an old computer from the 80s, and it makes me very happy. So I'm going to end here. Uh, thanks for joining me today in this, um, I think, a very special video for me. And I'll see you next time.